Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. And in reality, uh, this isn't just a Mormon Stories Podcast. This is also a Mormon Transitions Podcast. But uh, first of all, let me just give you the date. It's January 19th, 2017. Uh, I say this every time, but I absolutely mean it uh, every time and today. I am so excited for my current guest. This is someone I've wanted to interview for literally years, but I truly believe that this will be one of the most important interviews that I ever do. And I'm not um, I'm not intentionally adding any hyperbole. I really mean it. Uh, today, we're going to be interviewing a dear friend of mine. His name is Noah Rochetta. Um, Noah Rochetta uh, has been a listener of Mormon Stories for quite some time. Uh, so he's a dear friend. He's got so much wisdom to share with everybody. Um, and Noah is the founder of a website and a book and a podcast called SecularBuddhism.com. Um, and we're going to talk about that in our interview. But SecularBuddhism.com has become one of the top 100 religious themed podcasts in the world. Uh, from my perspective, based on what I understand, uh, Noah has not only published this podcast, but also written a book called Secular Buddhism. And he's appeared with me at many of my Mormon transitions, retreats and workshops, uh, talking about secular spirituality, secular Buddhism, mindfulness and that sort of thing. So before we actually launch into the interview, there's just a couple I, I want to set the stage. We're going to start by talking about Noah's story. So in that sense, it's going to be a very classic Mormon stories interview. Uh, I imagine that's going to take at least a couple hours to do. Um, from there, what we're going to do is we're going to um, dig into at least a good hour on secular Buddhism and the main principles of secular Buddhism. And I'm super excited about that because I believe that uh, secular Buddhism, which is not religious in any way, it's not supernatural in any way, um, it's an absolutely powerful and I would even argue essential paradigm both for positive mental health and for navigating um, Mormonism in or out of the church and just basic fundamental principles of good mental health. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. Then we're going to turn to doing an actual Mormon transitions interview. So those of you who were able to tune in to Margie's interview, I asked her a series of like 30 or 50 questions um, all about her transition from start to finish. And um, that was a really powerful interview that I know tens of thousands of people have really valued and appreciated. But what we also did is not just release that as an interview, we released that in chunks. So up on YouTube, we've got 30 to 50 little chunks of my interview with Margie dealing with various topics, uh, whether it's belief in God, uh, how you came out as a non-traditional believer, uh, etc. Um, and that, that project, Mormon Transitions on YouTube, is going to allow people to dig into various issues or aspects of their transition in a way that really specifically addresses practical concerns. On top of all that, Noah's faith transition story um, is one of a mixed faith marriage, uh, and it's one of remaining actively engaged in the church as a non-believer. So this this interview has something for everyone. It has something for people who have lost their faith, something for people who are in a mixed faith marriage, something for people who are trying to remain in the church, but as a non-believer and absolutely fundamental for people who have totally left. So it's powerful on tons of levels. So with all of that and we're live streaming like a six hour interview on Facebook <laughs> to anyone who wants to go the marathon. We've already got 41 people who have joined us. Noah Rochetta, welcome to Mormon Stories and Mormon Transitions. Thank you, John. I'm, I'm excited. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. So thank you for having me. My pleasure. Okay, so I do want to invite those who are joining us live to feel free uh, to tune in to ask comments, to ask questions, to give feedback. And I will integrate uh, as much of those into our discussion as I can. But to begin, Noah, we're going to do the first hour or two just on your story. Um, so why don't we begin by just talking a little bit about your background? Um, 
and anything that you think will be important background for for helping people understand the context of your Mormon experience and your transitioning and post Mormon experience. Okay, um, great. I guess I'll just start at the very beginning. Um, I was uh, born in Texas. Um, uh, I. Oftentimes when I'm talking about myself, I go into we. I talk about myself as we because I'm a, I have an identical twin brother. And it's been really hard to ever break away from that we uh, when I'm talking about myself. So if I say we, that's why. Okay. <laughs> so uh, born in Texas, uh, grew up in, in Dallas, north northern part of Dallas in Plano. Uh, went to elementary school, middle school. And then halfway through middle school, uh, my family moved to Mexico. So I finished middle school and all of high school in uh, Guadalajara, Mexico, um, which is where my mom is from. And then after graduating high school in Mexico, um, my twin brother and I went on our missions. We left the same day, uh, came home the same day. I served in Ecuador and and he served in Bolivia. And then after our missions, came home and went to school uh, in Utah. That's what brought me here. And he met uh, someone and got married and moved to Arizona. About three years later, I got married uh, and stayed here in Utah, uh, where uh, my wife is from. And kind of in, in a nutshell, that's like, I guess, the uh, part of the story. So, so you said your mom is from Mexico. Talk a bit about your parents, their cultural, ethnic backgrounds, and how right. they how they came into the church. I'm just curious. Yeah, so um, they literally just their worlds collided one day at the airport. My mom was flying up from Guadalajara to Dallas to go shopping for the weekend with her sister, and my dad was dropping off a friend at the airport. And he saw my mom and got brave and got out and started talking to her. And that's how they met. And uh, Is your dad of Mexican descent? or No. He's... No, he didn't speak Spanish. She didn't speak English. Uh, my sister or her sister did most of the translating. Um, and he, he started calling her and then visiting her down in Mexico. And eventually uh, they decided to get married. So your dad's puro gringo. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right. Very much. <laughs> All right. Okay, cool. Um, and and yeah, so, how did each of them join the church or So my mom comes from a Catholic background and my dad um was Episcopalian, I believe. And when so when they wanted to get married, they were not able to get married in the Catholic church because he had been married before. Um so she they had to settle on a, a random third party and they I think they they, they picked the uh, Episcopalian church, and that's where they got married. Um, and when my twin brother and I were about three, one of my dad's uh, closest friends, he had been in an accident that kind of got him thinking more seriously about life, and he found the church. I'm not entirely sure how that happened, but he's the one who... Um, ended up sharing with my dad, sending the missionaries over and um, sending him a Book of Mormon. And, and that's kind of where the conversion story started for my parents. Um, and my dad was very interested in it. I think my mom was a little bit more reluctant because of her, uh, her ties to her, her traditional beliefs. Um, and that whole process in itself was was, was kind of interesting because my, my dad decided to that he wanted to go ahead and join and my mom wasn't sure, and she consulted with her with the priest at the Catholic Church, and, <laughs> and and the advice she got was interestingly enough. He was like, you know, all paths lead to the same place. Wow. Do what's best for your family, and if you feel that this is what will bring the most uh, amount of harmony to your home, then go for it and don't stress about it. Which I think was uh, really good advice for her. And and then she she double checked with her mom, who is also very very orthodox and devout in, in her uh, Catholicism. And interesting, interestingly enough, got the same advice there, where she said, you know, put your family first, do what's right for your family. Uh, don't stress about, you know, at, at the end, 
in in a nutshell, I guess, kind of told her if there if there's a God and He's a loving God, then there's nothing to fear. You know, He knows your heart, and choosing to leave the church to join another church for the benefit of your family is a noble thing, and go for it. So that gave my mom permission to to kind of go with it, and uh, but she, I, I don't think she was ever. 100% certain if, if, it, if that's what made sense to her, um, I guess, theologically or, you know, she never really got into that. It was more of do what feels right and, and just go with it. Nice. So that was their relationship and, and that's how that worked. And so my, my brother and I essentially grew up from three on in the church um, and and I and I feel like we were always part of two cultures because when we lived in Mexico, we we attended Catholic school, we attended Catholic uh, the equivalent of seminary, while attending LDS seminary. Uh, every Friday we would go to mass at school. Every Sunday we would go to church, uh, and I felt like I was always immersed in in, in two cultures, two ideologies, and I felt uh, a fondness for. Uh, Catholicism, even though I knew I didn't align with it in terms of beliefs, uh, uh, the people that uh, I really cared about, you know, it was very meaningful to them. My grandma, my aunts and uncles, my cousins, you know, going to their first communions. It always felt, I never really felt like an outsider. I felt like I was there participating without uh, having to share the specific beliefs. And I never felt like uh, excluded. It always felt like the, f from our perspective, from the Catholic Church uh, down where we were in Mexico, it just felt very welcome. It's like uh, in our school, Nick and I were the only, well, actually there were four of us in the entire high school who were not Catholic. There was a Protestant boy, a Jewish girl, and then Nick and I were, were the kind of the random American Mormons. And uh, it, we always felt like we were included in everything. You know, they never... I don't re recall ever feeling like we weren't part of them. It was just kind of like treated like, yeah, just come be with us. That's kind of weird that you're not one of us, but sure, you're one of us. Um, so that's, uh, I, I always had that um, kind of the, the two cultures, not just between the countries that, you know, being half Mexican, half American, but in some ways feeling half Catholic, half Mormon. And and I know for me personally, I didn't feel the the solidification into Mormonism as an Orthodox thing until my mission. Right. So give me missions, one second. Missions tend to do that. Noah, while you're helping the UPS guy, I'm just going to say uh, that we just got a text from your brother. So Nick Thor Rochetta commented, "So glad this is happening. Love watching this live." So Nick's oh, Nick's fine. tuned in. Your two, your your brother. Um, and uh, that's super happy, uh, Nick. Nick, welcome. Glad you're glad you're joining us uh, on the on the stream. So that's fascinating, uh, Noah, uh, that you had sort of a mixed faith upbringing, uh, and uh, it sounds like a really powerfully um, compelling upbringing. I'll just say that that advice your mom got sounds a lot like the advice the Dalai Lama would give somebody, uh, and it's kind of how you. You start out every episode of Secular Buddhism by telling people what? What do you tell people? Yeah, I share uh, my favorite quote of his. It says, do not use what you learned from Buddhism to try to be a Buddhist. Just use it to be a better whatever you already are. Right, yeah. And, and I kind of got that advice from my grandma now that I think about it. When my brother and I were going on our missions, uh, we went to say goodbye to everyone in the family. And, and my grandma wanted to give us blessings. So uh, they kind of do the cross on your forehead, you know, and, and give you a blessing. And I remember getting the specific advice uh, that when you're out there, there are people who are searching for something. Look for those people and see if you can give them something. But then she also said there are people who are not searching for something. They're happy with what they have. Don't bug those people. Let them be happy with what they have. And she was referring to, uh, you know, Catholicism, kind of saying, don't mess with the Catholics who are happy to be Catholics. Leave us alone, but go find the people who are looking for something different in their lives. And I, and I took that to heart. I, that was kind of my philosophy on my, on my mission. I always felt like I know there are people out here who are searching. Those are the people I want to find because I think this message could be relevant and, and useful to them. But I never wanted to be in a position where I was trying to tear someone's 
uh, base down saying what you have, ignore that. There's something else you should look at. I love that. I love that. Very powerful. Okay, so you say that your mission was your introduction into sort of pure orthodoxy. Is that right? Yeah, it was. I think the experience for me uh, growing up in the church in Mexico, we didn't really deal with you know, the, the pioneer traditions or church history. All of that was kind of irrelevant for us. Uh, I feel in some ways uh, when you're outside of the U.S., uh, the church felt more about the what are the positive things that you know, just make you a better person or trying to understand concepts from that view. Um, so uh, I remember going into the MTC and, and learning things, going through the flip charts and we're doing mock uh, teachings, you know, and I would read something kind of like, huh, I didn't know we thought that or I didn't <laughs> know we believed that. <laughs> um, so I, I think it was it wasn't until my mission where things started to really solidify and I, I feel like I I had my my first transition into a much more orthodox view of uh, belief. And do you feel like you just kind of went full force into that? Was it was there cognitive dissonance? Uh, were you excited? What was that like to to move from more broad, diverse, heterogeneous minded to sort of orthodox minded? Um, I remember the, the, that transition felt good. I remember being, I remember feeling like, oh, this is what it feels to really believe, to really have a, a certainty now in my testimony. Where prior to that, it always kind of felt like, I remember on my, uh, my farewell speech, uh, mentioning something to the effect of, I'm, I'm excited to find people. And if they're not interested, you know, at least plant the seed that maybe one day they will be. And I remember after my, after that talk, someone in the audience, um, came up to me and said, just so you know, you're not out there to plant seeds. You're out there to, to convert <laughs> and bring people to, you know, to Christ. And I remember feeling chastised in my, in my approach of just wanting to plant seeds. Um, so when, when I was transitioning into more, a more orthodox view of all that, it made sense. And I remember thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, this is what it's all about. You know, I, have, I, I do need to share what is relevant to everyone um, and I always kind of battled that because I would picture people when, when I was talking to them, like, this is like my grandma, you know, who is so, uh, devout in her, uh, tradition, her religious tradition. Um, and, and I, and I always hesitated because I felt like I, I know that that's not right, you know, like good for you for having that, but that's not good enough for you. But I was reluctant to strip people away from something that was meaningful to them. And I think in the back of my mind, I didn't worry too much because I always thought, you know, if, if you didn't get it here, you'll get it at some point. Or, or <laughs> there's always the, the fail safe, you know, we'll get you once you die and then right. it's all good. <laughs> right. So, um, but yeah, those, those were kind of some of the experiences I recall from my mission. So anything sort of like really formative on your mission or you know, epic or important that you want to share or should we, or, or was, was it just kind of a traditional mission or anything? Important uh, it was a share? traditional mission. I think the most impactful part of it for me that I still uh, think about a lot was the discovery that being a part of something bigger than myself was, was an incredible experience. I remember early on in my mission, uh, walking down the street and, you know, there were some people sitting on the sidewalk who were drinking and one of them mumbled something and threw the bottle, uh, a bottle of beer at us. And I remember being so offended thinking, you don't even know me. Why would you, why would you treat me like that? And in the, you know, in the coming days, really thinking about that, feeling personally offended. And then like a switch, it just hit me where I realized, oh, they, he didn't throw that at me. He threw that at whatever I represent. And I remember letting go of the personal attachment at that point in my mission to this is me. And, you know, what I'm sharing with you is all on me. I remember at that point letting go of that and, and feeling like what I'm really doing is sharing something greater than me, a teaching that's greater than me, you know, uh, talking about a character that's greater than me, an organization that's greater than me. And I felt uh, from that moment on, I thoroughly enjoyed that experience of, of removing myself for a bit because up until then, life had always felt like, you know, it's me. 
And, and it was cool to experience that. And that's something I still value a lot about the mission experience. That's very Buddhist, actually. Um, uh, I, I'm just I'm dying to think about whether Nick was feeling and thinking similar things on his mission and if and to what extent you and he process things similarly versus differently in your respective missions. Do you have any sense for that since he was yeah, your twin? Um, we wrote to each other very often. And I, I remember it was surprising the insights we would share with each other and the experiences we were sharing with each other seemed uh, very, very simultaneous. He would experience something and I did too. And then we'd write about it. And, you know, back then it, everything took weeks. And by the time I'd read his letter and I'd calculate what he went through and, and some experience, I would think, oh, that's when I was going through this. <laughs> like the timing was almost always spot on. Yeah. I mean, we even with our, our assignments in the mission, we were, uh, you know, served as, uh, I think, district leaders within weeks of each other, zone leaders within weeks of each other. Uh. And then I remember sending him the news that I had been called to be an assistant uh, to the president. And he replied and said he was too. And it was like, Whoa. it was just incredible. We shared almost uh, identical experiences. And on one occasion, while we were both in the office, before we knew that we were both in the office, uh, I went to pick up some missionaries at the airport. And when they got off the plane, they were all whispering to each other and pointing. And as they got closer, they said, Elder Rochetta, how did, how did you get here? And, and I was like, wait, where did you guys come from? And they said, Bolivia. And that's when I was like, did an elder Rochetta take you to the airport? And they're like, yep. And I was like, that's my twin brother. So he literally took missionaries to the airport that I picked up at the airport. And we didn't know any of that until, you know, weeks later when our letters would arrive. That happened a lot to us. That must have been bizarre for them, like time travel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love that story. That's a great story. Um, Nick writes, Noah and I have always been able to speak for the other. We think the same. That's what Nick says. Yeah, um, I think that's, that's true. That's awesome. Okay. Uh, so, um, so tell us about the things that happened after your mission uh, that were either important or that you think led up to your faith transition. Okay. Um, I remember coming home. It was really exciting to reunite with, with Nick and to reunite with my family. Um, I do remember uh, growing up, my family in general, we always had a slightly more, um, uh, maybe nuanced is the right word, view of things in general. Like I, I would never say we were uh, orthodox in our approach to uh, Mormonism or anything else. Uh, growing up in Mexico, I think a lot of people um, kind of adopt the mindset of you play with the system and you mold you mold it rather than adhering strictly to rules. Uh, you know, for example, getting pulled over, you try to negotiate a way to get out of it instead of paying the fine. You know, those that kind of mindset is uh, a little bit more natural in in a culture like in Mexico. So coming home with a much more rigid mindset. I remember uh, one of my first experiences coming home, Nick and I were driving, I think the first time to, uh, in Mexico from being home. And at one of the intersections, I turned left on green without the, uh, the green arrow. And I had forgotten that in Mexico, you can't turn left on green. It has to be the arrow only. And sure enough, get pulled over. And right away, the officer starts playing that game of, you know, if I can find a way to help you. Maybe you can find a way to help me and kind of makes it obvious that he's going for the, the bribe. <clears throat> and I remember at that point thinking, no, I, I mean, I just came home from a mission. The last thing I would ever do is bribe anyone now. Like I, I'm so beyond that. And so we started negotiating with him and trying to get out of it without getting out of it. And he was frustrated because he wasn't used to that. He, he was used to people just immediately going into the, okay, yeah, I'll bright, you know, I'll play this game. And we wouldn't. And after about 15 minutes of, of him trying to get us to do something, finally he says, well, what would, you, you know, how do you want to get out of this? And I said, <laughs> well, I'll tell you how I want to get out of this. I said, um, I think it would be really noble of you to give me a warning and, and then I'll, I'll leave here knowing that I shouldn't do that again. <laughs> and he was just like, ah, oh, 
he didn't know what to say, and he let us go. It's the first time I ever got out of a, a ticket in Mexico without having to bribe. I remember thinking, yeah, this that's the right approach, you know, and I was going to try to tackle life that way, much more uh, rigid in my, uh, no more gray zones, try to be more black and white. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Love that um, story. And then, and then going to school, you know, I think my experience of going to school in college was quite different from high school. In high school, I still had the mindset of find ways to make this process easier. You know, cheating on a test didn't seem like an ethical problem. It was more of a, you're just playing the system. Uh, this is probably why corruption is so bad in Mexico. I think we all kind of had that mindset down there. Um, but then in college, it was like really fun to do it all the right way, like actually study hard. Instead of spending time on deciding how I was going to write the answers on a little piece of paper, uh, it was fun to actually spend that time studying and realize I could get the good grade doing it that way. So college was a whole different experience than high school, and I think that was you know, directly because of the mission experience. Nice. Um, and then went on and got married and uh, really enjoyed that experience. And it wasn't until later in my marriage that, you know, the first time I, I had kind of struggled at times with, with that idea of, when is it okay to be gray in your view of things versus just pure black and white? And I remember at times feeling guilty telling people stories about growing up in Mexico. Like I was ashamed to, to tell someone that I've bribed a police officer or that I cheated on a high school test. Um, and, and then I went through an experience that uh, was uh, like a breach of confidence with someone really close to me. And I remember that was the first, that was the, the initial catalyst to thinking um, something was wrong with the, with, the, with the black and white approach to life. Because sometimes there are gray areas. And sometimes it's not as simple as right or wrong, black or white, good or bad. And it was during that uh, experience in my life, that phase, I guess you could say, where I felt really let down. I felt really down on myself. Uh, I think my self-esteem was pretty low. And just thinking, um, you know, it's hard to be uh, hurt by somebody that, you, that you're close to. And in, in that mindset, I, I wanted to try to become much more rigorous in my, in my view of uh, all, all things, including and especially my beliefs. And so I started studying really hard and studying church and history. Just, just, just really quick, um, with, you know, without going into any details, just so I can repeat, so you you experienced something with a with a loved one or someone you cared about that you just felt you felt hurt by that, right? With yeah, yeah. I, so <clears throat> it was a it was a pivotal moment for me to feel. Uh, I've always just been very open and and giving people the benefit of the doubt and very trusting and very optimistic. Like those are all kind of natural traits for me. And going through this experience left me. Um, in a way, closed off, thinking, you know, if somebody close to you can can lie to you to your face, or can or can do something that's hurtful to you, um, it made me start questioning everything, and especially my my own ability to discern if I could if I could interpret people or situations uh, with certainty. So, at that time, I I really dive into trying to be much more orthodox, I guess, or more uh, knowledgeable about the church in general. And and I started reading Rough Stone Rolling. I think that was one of the first books that I read. And I don't remember it for me being a big impact in the sense of um, like earth shattering. But I do remember thinking it's troubling to me that if there are things that happened in a way that I didn't know that they happened that way, the thing itself isn't what troubles me. It's the fact that I didn't know that that's how it happened. I remember specifically thinking as I was studying church history, there's nothing here more crazy than a burning bush talking to Moses. The difference is I've known about the burning bush from day one. And, you know, had the story been that Moses was talking to someone there at the table and they're drinking tea together. And then later you read it and you're like, wait a second, no, it was a burning bush. Then it would be problematic. But there was nothing inherent in any of the church history that I was encountering that seemed like 
uh, you know, this can't be what I thought it was. I just remember thinking, why was it, you know, why is the picture painted a different way? Why didn't I know about this? But that led me to want to read more. And the more I read into it, the more um, difficult uh, the overall view became for me. And it wasn't even specifically the church. I think for me it, it went on because I wanted to understand, well, if this is this, then what is this? And I kept going back, and I started studying New Testament historicity uh, with, uh, through Bart Ehrman, who's a, a New Testament scholar. And I was really realizing a lot of the troubles even with you know, just the way the, the New Testament was compiled and, and how it was written. And that whole process also became problematic for me. So at some point, uh, rather than experiencing, I, I guess, a traditional um, trans- faith transition or faith crisis with, with the church specifically, it was more of, what if we're wrong about everything we've ever thought about religion or about the entire, uh, the entire narrative that we use for you know, understanding our, who we are, what, where we came from, why we're here, where we're going, all of that kind of went up in the air for me at the same time. It was never specific to, oh, it, it, you know, it's specifically the church's narrative that I have a problem with. It's kind of just the overall religious narrative became troublesome for me. Yeah, so you went right to the root of it. Um, what what made you think to read Rough Stone Rolling as a reaction to being betrayed by a loved one? Like, why, why how Rough Stone Rolling? How did you get the idea to do that? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think if I remember correctly, the process for me was part of my inability to discern, uh, a person, you know, their intent. Like I, I I remember specifically feeling like I, I've, I'm living my life in, in a way that is righteous. Everything that's supposed to be checked off is checked off. Anything that you're not supposed to be doing, I'm not doing it. Why was I not able to discern uh, that this specific thing was going on in my life? Why was I not able to sense a red flag or something to help uh, prevent uh, this um, breach of confidence the way that it happened? And that was troubling for me because uh, I genuinely felt like I, I was supposed to know. Like that's the whole point of, of, the, of the spirit is to help, help you know things. So that was troubling for me. And, and, I, and I think I wanted to understand... Uh, rather than immediately thinking, oh, well, then there is no spirit. I remember thinking, I've, I've misunderstood what the purpose of the spirit is. I want to understand that more. Um, <clears throat> so that led to, I, I want to say, uh, um, there's a series of books by Joseph Fielding Smith called... Doctrines um, of Salvation. Doctrines of Salvation. I started there, and then that led to like Joseph Smith's book. Um, he had a little red pamphlet. Book that I read. Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith or Truth Restored or something like that. Uh, yeah, I don't remember. Lectures something on like Faith. That. Okay. Yeah, Lectures on Faith. Okay. And then that led to something else. And then uh, at some point throughout all of that reading, I was thinking, this is fascinating because it's all new. I was experiencing what I did on my mission where it was like, this is a Mormonism I'm not familiar with. <laughs> um, and somewhere in that search, I was told, if, you know, a really good book that'll give you a synopsis of all of it for church history that's that's not biased. I, I wasn't interested in anything that would even hint of being the church. And, and I was told uh, Rough Stone Rolling was a good source because it was written by someone who's not antagonistic. And uh, so that's why I think that's what led me. Led you, it, only, let... it only left me with more questions because then I was like, well, I didn't know this either or that either, you know. Okay. So this had to have been around 2005, 2006 when you're reading Rough Stone Rolling. Do you even remember? Uh, it was 2010. Okay. Okay. Wow. Oh, wow. I met you that late. Yeah. I think my first time I talked to you was when I was in my PhD. Okay. So that makes sense. So we're talking 2010. Yeah. You read Rough Stone Rolling um, and you go right to the root of religion. So where do you go from there? You're questioning now all religion, which means you're probably questioning God. Where'd you go from there? Yeah, I was questioning all of it. I remember early on, um, uh, I, the first time I hinted anything was to my brother, to Nick. 
And at this time, you know, I felt he was the person closest to me who understands me the best, the safest person to go to. And I, at this point, it had probably been three or four months of, of me really doubting what if we got it all wrong? And, and remember, this stems from the experience of thinking, if I misunderstood somebody that I thought I knew really well, what if I've misunderstood everything that I felt confident with? So I approach Nick. On, we were on a trip. and Were you I hinted, both living in Arizona at the time? Um, no, I was living in Utah. Okay, okay. Just he curious. He was still in Arizona. Okay. We were in California visiting a good friend who's Catholic, uh, my, my good high school buddy. And in the car, we're just kind of talking. And he was telling us something uh, about like, you know, I love... Uh, I, I love my religion, but it's more of a cultural thing. It doesn't, it's not such a big deal if it's true or not. Something to that effect. And I remember hinting at that time thinking, I think what I said was something along the lines of, what if we're all wrong about everything? What if every single person who's ever told a story is wrong about that story? And I remember Nick pushing back, kind of like, no, 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 don't even go down that route there, you know, like, we have answers and you have the answers. You just have to adhere to those answers. And I don't remember if we talked about it in, in the moments after that conversation, but I felt strong pushback and I felt bad for, for bringing it up. And I, I, I just didn't bring anything up the rest of that trip. And meanwhile, I had been listening to, by then I had discovered Mormon stories and I was just devouring a new podcast every day and learning more and more. And Finally, I reached out to Nick one day and I said, look, I know this whole topic is uncomfortable for you. Um, you've been supportive with me in, in this trial that I'm going through. And the reality is this. I'm going through something that's very difficult that I can't talk to anyone about because I feel like it's taboo to even say this. But I have serious doubts about my understanding of life and the world in general. And and I said, I know it's uncomfortable for you, but I don't know who else to talk to. And I mean, right away, he was like, you're right. Yeah, I mean, that's, of course, I should be the person that no matter what you're going to say, I'm here for you. So let's hear it. What's troubling you? And I think he kind of wanted to help me through this, you know, help me find um, uh, certainty again. Um, so I start just telling them things and well I, I heard this and you know this doesn't make sense and I learned that and that doesn't make sense and and he was surprised too he was kind of like well I, I've never heard about that I've never heard about that and, and his approach was let me look into this a little bit I'll research it more and let's keep talking but like don't you know don't worry about this we can find a way for everything to make sense and then he just goes on the same route and starts reading church history and uh, really and not just church history but all history, religious history, and uh, the history of Christianity. And it seemed to me, in, in hindsight, like this process was quick. Within a couple months, you know, we'd still be calling each other every day. Well, did you know this? Well, yeah, did you know that? And we're sharing, sharing, sharing. And out of the, <clears throat> out of the blue, he's like, well, my wife and I have been talking, and we decided the church is not for us. We're going we're gonna to leave it. So he jumped ahead of you. Oh, yeah. And I was like, no, wait, don't, you know, <laughs> are you sure? Like, take it slowly. And it was very abrupt. And, and my parents called and they were like, what's going on with Nick? And I was like, at that point, I felt bad because I felt like I was the catalyst to his decision. So I didn't want my parents to know anything. I just said, you know, there's just stuff that I've been talking uh, with him about. And uh, I don't want a sharing of it. If, if you want to know his perspective, just talk to him. Well, then I don't, they start talking and it seems like, again, a, another couple months go by and then my parents are like, hmm, we're just not very interested. It, it wasn't a big abrupt, like, we don't believe. It was, it was just, a, this isn't for us. We're done. The church? Yeah. Your whole family starts falling away. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and again, I, I just felt so much guilt. I felt horrible because I felt like I was the source of introducing doubt. Um. But at the same time, I could see, especially with my mom, and I was re really surprised at this, I saw liberation for her. She had been secretly harboring for years a resentment against leaving what felt like her, her cultural roots and, and her mom and her si sisters and her siblings that are all very devout Catholic. And she immediately reverted to what felt comfortable to her and to her roots. And that's the, that's the first time I remember thinking, oh, 
I'm so sorry that you felt like you couldn't have that in your life up until now. And, and I felt very happy for her. And meanwhile, all this time, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, I, I kind of have this mindset of, I need to figure it out. I need to figure all of this out and fix all of it. And, and I start studying philosophy and, and religion. And I was always fascinated by uh, philosophy and psychology in high school. That's one of the first things I wanted to study in college. I never did. Um, but that led me down this route of studying world religions. And I attended a, a lecture series on the five major world religions. And, you know, I'm kind of just listening with this perspective of which one am I going to hear that actually makes sense that I'll say, ah, oh, maybe, maybe they have it right. And I didn't get that, you know, it goes through Christianity, then Islam, uh, Judaism, Hinduism, and the last series was on Buddhism. And when it gets to the series on Buddhism, I didn't know much about it. And I was really fascinated with their, their take on things. And it was um, something to the effect, I remember, of uh, interacting with, the, with the, either the lecturer or someone there where I was like, you know, how does this information help me to arrive at, a, uh, at an understanding of the truth? And I remember they were kind of like, well, what do you mean the truth? I was like, yeah, like, I want to discover what's the truth in life. And, and, and he just kind of laughed. He's like, oh, you're not going to find that here. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> He's like, yeah, no, the only truth you're going to get here is the truth of no truth, the truth that there is no truth. And I was kind of like, what are you talking about? And, and that was where I was like, I want to learn more about this. I started to feel like there was just no pressure there to know anything with certainty. And that was very refreshing for me because I, I had been going through this internal struggle with my worldview. Is it true or is it not true? Is it right or is it wrong? Is it, are they right or are they wrong? Everything was black and white. And this introduced an entirely new way of thinking, which was, it's not about white or black or right or wrong like something can be true and not true it can be true to you and not true to me it can be good for you and not good for me and it was like mind-blowing it was like oh okay i want to learn more about this and to, to remind me who is this person again that told you that truth uh this is a, a lecture on um on world religions okay so general lecture okay Got yeah it. It. yeah okay so at that point, I decide, well, I want to learn a lot more about this. And I just start diving into um, Buddhism as a philosophy. And, what, know, you, what, I, what, what was it about Buddhism that you, that tur what turned you to Buddhism specifically? That I, it was the only one that when I would ask certain questions, never hinted at, you know, what you need is this. This is what you need. And let me tell you why this is right. It was the only one that said, Oh, no, there's no right. And we're definitely not right. If you think we're right, then this is not for you. And that was the irony is that where I was like, okay, well, then tell me more about that. How does that make sense? I love that. <laughs> love that. <laughs> so, yeah, then I started down that path and trying to understand how, how can, why do they view the world that way? And, and I would listen to like the Dalai Lama or Thich Nhat Hanh. And there was just this sense of contentment and peace like there was just no worry no no stress and they weren't it felt like they're not trying to sell anything so that i wanted that i was like how do you arrive at that place of uh, of such genuine contentment with things with life as it is like th there's no it felt like there was no hidden agenda when when i was listening to them talk about their own ideology and that, uh, for me, was fascinating. I wanted to know why. How do they think? Why do they think the way they think? So that, you know, I started reading about it and studying and book after book after book. And um, and that went on for a couple of years. And at some point, I felt like it all clicked. I, I finally got what I think Buddhism was trying to allude to all along, is that your aha moment comes the moment you realize there's nothing to get. It's like, the greatest thing you'll get is that there's nothing to get. And and I had been convinced up until that point, you know, I'm always taking notes, like, I'm going to figure this out. And I remember just letting it all go at that point, thinking, oh, that's the point, is that there is no point. Like, you just get to experience life authentically, and there's no competition. It's not, I'm not trying to make sure that I got it right, and I'm not trying to correct you if I think you got it wrong, because it was beyond that. There was no it wasn't about that. And that was really refreshing for me. And, uh, you know, when we're in the Orthodox mindset or when we've been raised in the Orthodox mindset, 
that can be perceived as very troubling and actually a flaw because I think for many, the appeal of an, of an orthodox high demand religion is that it has all the answers and is that it tells you exactly what to do. Um, and so, uh, you know, we'll dig more into that both in our secular Buddhism episode, but also in our Mormon transitions episode. But I, I can see from your perspective how that would have been incredibly enlightening and refreshing. And for many others, that's allergic and disconcerting and distressing. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. So how, um, I'm curious how the Landmark Forum got uh, integrated into your study of Buddhism. And then I really want to just talk about what that was like for your 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 wife and your young family to you know how you how you manage that um yeah i think it was a a scary experience for sure uh, anytime uh you have somebody who views the world differently than you it's scary uncertainty is scary and especially in the in the orthodox mindset because you know from that mindset we know there's a right way and we know that every other way is wrong no matter how good it is it's still wrong and um so to, to, to start expressing um, with more honesty to, to my wife, for example, my, my way of viewing the world and what made sense to me, I think it was very scary. And in a lot of ways, probably still is. Um, but I think what, what started to happen right away is she started to notice that in spite of my um, uh, disbeliefs or in spite of my doubts to, to certain truth claims, I wasn't changing. I was still who I've always been. Um, I was still, I was still just me. And, and, and that's where I, I don't know exactly how long that process took, but that's when she started feeling safe again. And I remember a couple times, you know, having to explain things like, uh, you know, when, when you feel your security based on a belief, it's, it's, it's not really substantial. It's, you know, for example, uh, you know, if, if you feel that, um, well, I get, let's just give the example. Like if, if, if you, you know, if you felt like your, uh, spouse was, um, being unfaithful to you, believing that that's what's happening is what causes the anxiety and the stress. It may be that, that, you know, that's not happening at all, but because you believe that it is, um, you experience unnecessary anxiety and stress in the relationship. Now, the flip side of that could be maybe it is happening, but you don't know and you don't think that it is. So you're living, you know, with with uh, peace or contentment, thinking everything's good when really it's not. In both of those scenarios, the problem isn't necessarily what's happening. It's it's the way we perceive or the the belief we have of what's happening. So. I remember telling her, now imagine, you know, if you feel that our safety net in our relationship hinges on my beliefs, you know, I believe that I should be a good husband or a loyal husband or, uh, you know, all those things, that's where your safety comes from. Now imagine knowing that it, it you know, regardless of what I believe, um, the safety comes from knowing I'm just, I wouldn't do that or uh, so th I don't know if that makes sense, but I remember that was kind of a pivotal moment in our relationship to feel like, huh, it's not the belief that keeps me uh, in a loving marriage. It's the actions of staying in a loving marriage that keep me in a loving marriage, regardless of what I believe, regardless of what she believes. And I think we both kind of felt at that point, OK, the beliefs can take a second, uh, you know, a, a back seat to this whole thing. Like we're, if we're committed to our relationship it's okay if we both have different worldviews and different beliefs. And from that moment on, it started to feel like it was going to be okay. I think, I think a way that occurs to me to kind of restate that is you, you can believe and feel all sorts of things, but your beliefs and your feelings can be wrong. And they can be wrong in terms of uh, you know, they can, they, they're not necessarily reliable. They can fail. They can be based on things that are false, uh, in every direction. And so really the only thing you can really, really kind of put a stake in is people's behavior because behavior is the ultimate, is the ultimate Testament. 
because I could tell you I'm faithful to you as a spouse, but I could be cheating. And you could feel great about the marriage and it sucks, or you could hate the marriage and the marriage is actually pretty good. Yeah. But it's all, it's all perspective and perspective isn't necessarily reliable. Exactly. So am I showing up to the marriage every day? Am I treating you with respect? Cause that's really all, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I remember at that point kind of thinking what we both decided and agreed on was, well, that's how we'll approach this. Yeah. We're going to have differences in, in, in views, which we already had. We already had differences in political views or differences in, you know, uh, general ideologies. Um, and now we were just going to have some differences in our worldviews. But how do we show up for each other every day? Are we committed, you know, to to our relationship? And 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 it felt like we would both know that from this point on going forward. Like we feel that we can tell each other, you know, if something's not right, rather than hiding that we can just say hey this this doesn't feel right or this you know this is something we need to talk about and it it really enhanced uh, our ability to communicate with each other going through all of this loved it yeah i love that idea that uh we're always terrified of a religious or a faith transition and i love the idea that it can actually strengthen marriages even mixed faith marriages it can actually strengthen relationships and deepen them so uh, that's I love hearing that. And I and I have to add, I was terrified uh, the day that I thought, you know, I'm going to finally tell her and come out about being uh, skeptical or being, you know, a, uh, an unbeliever. It was terrifying. I, in the months or maybe even year, year or two leading up to that point, I was convinced that the day that that happens is the day our marriage ends, because I'd always thought that, you know marriage is contingent on having shared beliefs and i she took it so well it, it was difficult and it, you know it was very scary and uncertain but she was like we've been through harder things we've been through uh you know we can this is something we can do and we'll do it together like don't feel like you're alone in this it's let's figure this out and that's part of the the experience of being partners is that we're partners through whatever we go through and I remember feeling just really good. It was like, okay, I can hold space for my doubts and at the same time feel safe and, and certain in our, in our marriage that it's okay. It doesn't have to spell disaster there. What kept you from your, your brother and sister-in-law had left, then your parents leave. Uh, what kept you from just saying, I'm out of here? Like, yeah, uh, do, do you, do you want to mention your wife's name on this episode? Is that okay? Or do you not? Or do you sure, care? Yeah. Okay, Giselle, right? Yes. What kept you from just saying, Giselle, I'm out of here. You can go to church all you want. But my parents have left. My brother's left. I'm leaving and I'm out. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I It, it certainly has crossed my mind on occasions. <laughs> um, but what I found is I realized I there are things I like about the church. I like the social aspect, especially where I live. It's a very small community. I feel like we're all really close. The people you see at church are the same people you see at school, uh, at the store, at the rodeo for the 4th of July. It's just a very tight-knit community. And uh, rather than feeling like that was a constraint for me or, or, or feeling like that's smothering, I felt the opposite. I feel like you know, I, I, support, um, I support my community and the things that my neighbors believe it's meaningful to me because it's meaningful to them, even if I don't believe those same things. And I remember, um, you know, one specific occasion studying, again, studying Buddhism, there is an, an instance where uh, the Buddha's cousin is talking to him about the spiritual path or the, you know, the path of spirituality is a path where you find connection and meaning. It's not about beliefs. It's about feeling connected and about finding meaning in life. And he asks him specifically, you know, with what you're building up here with with the congregation, the, the you know, what does that speak about this whole thing? And and, and the Buddha kind of tells him, you know, a lot of people think, oh, no, no, he, t he tells him, how much of the spiritual friendships do you think makes up the totality of the spiritual life? And he says, uh, probably about 50% or so. And he says, no, Ananda, the spiritual friendships is the whole of the way. And I remember that that was a very meaningful moment for me. And, and that day specifically, I was thinking about 
you know, from work, I went to pick up my kids who are who are babysat by uh, a lady in our ward who her family is uh, just, you know, the, 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 the kindest, nicest people. And I remember thinking that day, that's that's been my experience with most people in the church. They are incredible people who who are trying their best based on the way that they view the world and believe the world to live up to those beliefs. And it, it seemed like this precious thing that I, I would never want to just outright dismiss or give up based solely on my belief being different. Um, and I remember that day kind of feeling like this is okay. I can be involved with something that I don't fully uh, believe. And, and it, ironically, it took me back to my earlier experience in life of that's how I lived my Catholicism, never being a Catholic and always feeling uh, deeply tied to Catholicism. And now I kind of feel the same way with my with my view of Mormonism. I may not share uh, the same beliefs, um, but I feel a connection to uh, to those beliefs and to the the people who share those beliefs. Um, and, and then one Sunday, I remember thinking, you know, I'm not going to go today. And um, and my wife and kids got in the car and they drove off, and it was just heart wrenching because I have such little kids still. And it was like, oh, you know, I, I don't want them to have to, I don't want my wife to have to go and wrestle with the three kids all alone. Like, what what does it cost me to just go and participate and just sit there? Like, uh, you know, I spent uh, many weeks of my life going to mass just because that's where my friends and my family were. So I just sat there with them. And then I, I, it kind of dawned on me, I think that's ultimately the message that uh, Christianity is trying to impart anyway. It's that you know, you, you support the people by supporting them. You, you, um, you know, mourn with those who mourn. Uh, you know, that concept was like, why not just go and sit and participate with something that's meaningful to them? It doesn't mean just because I don't believe this, I shouldn't be a part of this. Um, uh, all those things kind of cross my mind. And that's, that's kind of the, where I am with it now. It's something that I enjoy. It's meaningful to the people that I care about. And I have no problem with with participating as much as it feels comfortable or as much as I'm allowed. We're going to, we're going to go more into depth on how you've, uh, navigated your relationship with the church and your marriage, um, as a semi-believer, non-believer. Do you even care? Do you give yourself a label? I know Buddhism doesn't like labels. So <laughs> do, do you describe yourself in a certain way? Um, it depends, uh, you know, as much as I don't like labels, it's impossible to not have labels because others give you the labels. So I've tried to navigate with the, you know, what's the label that best fits me that others could give me because especially in the church, the two biggest labels are, are you one of us or are you not one of us? You know, right. are you in or are you out? And that one's been difficult to navigate for me because I feel like, well, but I could say yes to either of those labels, but then there's a big but. You know, I've got to explain a lot behind it, which you don't have time to do, and nobody really cares. So um, I think if I had to go with any label, I, I've been comfortable with the label of uh, not necessarily that I'm Buddhist, but that I teach Buddhism or that I practice Buddhism, because then that leaves space for like, well, what does that mean? Well, you know, there's a lot to talk about there, but. Um, as far as belief or non-belief, I, I think non-belief is, is, is a label that's accurate because I simply don't share the belief of many of the things that are taught both in, in the church and, and with uh, the Christian worldview in general. Um, I, I don't view it as <clears throat> in opposition to, like, well, it's either true or it's false. I just more... It's, it's just kind of irrelevant to me. I think in the same way that it would be irrelevant to you about what a Zoroastrian believes. It's kind of like, you know, are you a Zoroastrian or are you a non-Zoroastrian? It's like, <laughs> well, it's kind of irrelevant. I'm just, it's just nothing to me. That's kind of how I view belief in general. I mean, even the, the, the basic existential question to me is just kind of like, it's just, I don't know, it's irrelevant. Not important. Yeah. How do you... Um... And, and again, we'll just touch on this briefly. How do you sit, how have you avoided sitting in church and not feeling like, you know, you were contributing to, uh, with your name, with your time, with your involvement, 
contributing to whatever harm the church does kind of complicit did you ever or did you did, did that never occur to you or do you just think that's wrong uh no it's occurred to me i don't think it had occurred to me until um the more recent uh stance uh you know with the church and um uh children of of same-sex couples that was uh probably one of the first times where i felt like by by not being vocal and accepting I'm complicit in in what seems like a form of discrimination. I remember that was the first time that it occurred to me that my silence on the issue could be interpreted as, you know, a statement. Um, but I haven't really allowed it. It doesn't trouble me because I don't share that belief. It, so, um, and by simply going there, it doesn't, to me, I don't feel complicit in, in, I feel like by by simply going to church and being there, um, in a lot of ways, is like being an American. I travel the world as an American, and yet I don't line up with all the ideologies that you know the government espouses. So I, I don't know if that's a valid comparison, but in, in a way, that's kind of how I view it. It's like, well, you know, I I don't identify with the with this specific view, and I'll be. I'm vocal to, you know, to share with somebody if they were to ask me that I don't view it this way or, you know, I want to, I feel like I'm, I'm accepting of anyone how they are. There's no way, there's no wrong way to be. If that's how you are, that's how you are. There's, it's not that it's wrong or right or, or even, you know, any more right than any other way. It's just how you are. Um, so I, I think that's how I've kind of treated that. What about when you hear people uh, talking about Native Americans as dark-skinned curse from God or gay people as a, a bad sign of the times or even talking about Joseph Smith as having one wife or any time the discourse at church is either inaccurate or discriminatory. I remember reaching this boiling point where it became incredibly difficult to for me to sit and listen, especially because I knew that I had to be silent in church um, to be welcome. And if I actually spoke my truth or tried to clarify uh, that I would, that, you know, that it just caused problems and that I would probably not be welcome. That having to kind of stuff my own feelings and expressions while I heard other people not only be able to express, but to but to express things that were actually uh, many times har either wrong or harmful, that that discrepancy caused an incredible amount of distress and cognitive dissonance in me for a decent period of time. Uh, how did you ever experience that, and how did you handle it? Uh, yeah, early on I did. I, I guess I should preface this with, with saying my involvement uh, with being at church isn't, I, I don't go to Sunday school. I don't participate in, in the classes. I'm just kind of there. And my job, we have a one-year-old, so my job is I walk the halls with her while my wife teaches. Um, I think it would be, it, it, maybe it could be difficult to have to sit through a lesson and think, well, uh, you know, I don't agree with how this is being presented or not. Um, but I do have to say in, in my ward specifically here in, in Woodland where I live, it's a, it's a very diverse audience where any topic, no matter what the topic is, I feel like people will jump in on both sides and it's never been taboo to hash stuff out like that. So in a lesson where, you know, something is presented like, well, this is this, you would have you know, one or two or three people already coming in from the other side saying, no, that's not how that happened. You know, it's our job to know how things, church history really played out. And, and you get the, the, you know, kind of the, the discourse going that makes people stirred and a little upset, but that's never really been taboo. We have enough people in our ward who are very open about everything that I've, I feel like it would be easy to just, if I wanted to jump in on one side or jump in on the other side, but my personality has always just been, I just listen and don't let it get to me or bother me. What about the impulse to want to be authentic, to want to be able to express who you are, to not create an appearance of something that isn't authentic to you, and just to be 
understood by by community members, loved ones, because it's you know usually you have to just keep everything to yourself to to be accepted. Um, have you ever struggled with feeling inauthentic? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think I struggled with that a lot up until I, I started my podcast. And, you know, once I had a, a place where I could be authentic and, and, and feel like this is me portraying myself to the world in an authentic way, this is how I view the world, this is how I understand things, that platform allowed me to be authentic. And, um, and it's just out there. So I feel like the misunderstanding is inevitable. Somebody who doesn't uh, you know, if they don't listen to my explanation of how I understand or see things, of course they're going to misinterpret or misunderstand how I am. And I felt like that that would that was unavoidable because by sitting there and 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 giving off the impression that I align with these same views and beliefs, I'm giving off a false impression. By sitting there and saying I do not agree with this, and you know, putting my my stance that I'm you know, that I don't view this, that's also giving off the wrong impression. And I realized early on, that why, just why is that wrong? That. Why is that the wrong impression? Um, because so what I mean is if I were, if I were to give off this impression that, Oh, I'm here with you and I believe like you, that's wrong. Right. And if, if I'm sitting there and saying, I don't believe this, they will also be having the wrong impression. Why? of me thinking, why oh, is that second part wrong? Oh, because maybe they're thinking, oh, he wants to sin or, oh, okay, he must have it. done something. Got it. You know, so either way, I will be misunderstood. Got it. Got it. Sorry, I missed that second part. OK. And and you probably don't want them to think that you object to their right to have beliefs or disrespect their beliefs. Right. 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 Because sometimes people think that if you disagree, you must disrespect. Right. Right. Yeah. OK. How real quickly. Um, you know, the, the hardest part, and we'll get, we'll get to this in the Mormon transitions interview as well. Uh, the, one of the hardest parts is being a second class citizen. Um, in other words, do you go to the temple? If you, you know, to go to the temple, you have to pay a full tithing. Do you want to pay a full tithing to go, to go to the temple? You have to answer the temple recommend inter interview questions are, are you lying? Do you lie or do you just try and talk around them or talk in coded language? Um, and then do you feel ethical if you've deceived your bishop or stake president? And then even separate from the temple, there's uh, baptizing or confirming kids or um, participating in priesthood ordinances. But if you don't really believe in the power of the priesthood and you don't really believe that baptism is necessary or that there even is a priesthood, power by which you're conferring the Holy Ghost? Are you again doing something deceitful? But if you're not doing it, then you're publicly shamed because um, people are saying, well, he's not baptizing his child. Why is that? He's not in the temple. Why is that? He can't attend the marriage. Um, how have you dealt with that? Yeah, uh, good questions, because I think that was a difficult process for me to decide early on. Do I you know, can I nuance the way I give my answers to these questions? You know, what felt ethical for me? And I had to decide early on that I just had to go with what felt right for me. And as, as uncomfortable as that was, that meant not participating uh, with going to the temple or uh, wearing garments or, you know, a lot of things that, and the premise for me was, I know how meaningful this is to someone. You know, especially my wife, you know, I have this at home where this is something that's very meaningful to her. And I would never want her to feel like I treat this like in any way of, of, of uh, disrespect. And I felt like for me to continue to engage in those activities or, or, or to live <laughs> that way um, while not truly uh, believing that that was, you know, uh, something meaningful for me was a way of, of mocking it. So I had to decide early on, like, as uncomfortable as it's going to be, I'm going to just be up front and say, this is something I don't want to participate in. I don't, you know, I don't want to have a, a temple recommender. I don't want to. Um, so that kind of happened early on with, with me personally. But where it started to get tricky was, you know, when a nephew's getting baptized and we're all sitting there and the moment comes up for, you know, it's just kind of like this general, all men in the family come up here, 
And I found myself on a couple of those occasions feeling really torn and really uncomfortable because I didn't want to feel like an outsider. I didn't want to feel like I'm not part of this. Uh, so the first time that happened and I was kind of caught off guard, I did just stand up and I went up and I participated in the ordination of, of one of my nephews and, and I felt I, I felt bad. I felt I felt like there's something wrong with it because at that point people in the family know that I don't participate in other things or that I don't share, you know, the same beliefs. And I didn't want them to think that I was treating this like like, oh whatever. So then when the next event like that happened with my nephew, another nephew, whose dad is the bishop, is my bishop, and, and happens to be my brother-in-law, um, I was able to communicate with him and say beforehand, and I asked him, I said, I don't want to make any assumptions here. I, I would love to participate, but I don't want to be disrespectful in any way. Do you think it's appropriate for me to to participate if, for me, this is simply a rite of passage? It's a cultural rite of passage. Um and he didn't reply to me. It took a, a few days. But the day of the baptism, um, he whispered to his son. His son came over to me and said, uh, Uncle Noah, would you be willing to stand in the circle? And it, it made me feel very emotional because um, he reached out to me and kind of extended that, you know, it's okay. So I, I participated then. And then when it was over, he came up and he, uh, my, my bishop, my brother-in-law, he gave me a big hug. And, and I said, thank you for allowing me to be a part of that. And he said, of course. And I said, and thank you for not making me feel that pressure that it has to mean something more than a simple rite of passage. And he was just like, of course, he made me feel so good. Um, and then and then months later, as we've been preparing for, for my own son's baptism, I've been confronted with that again because it's like, I know how meaningful this is for my wife or, and for uh, the people in the ward and, and my, my in-laws, my family. Um, and uh, so with this one, I approached it differently. I think standing in the circle is one thing, but actually, you know, performing an ordinance, I didn't, uh, it, I, I didn't, I don't want to come across as disrespectful in any way to what is meaningful to somebody else with their beliefs. Um, so with this round, I, I kind of decided collectively in discussing with my wife and and her discussions with with uh, her brother, our brother-in-law kind of the consensus of what if let, let's just I sh maybe I shouldn't participate because if it doesn't mean the same thing to me that it means to them I would hate for somebody to feel uncomfortable like why is he doing this then you know if he doesn't believe why is he doing this so the easiest way around that is to just not participate and the only negative side of that for me was just the ego side thinking oh I don't want people thinking why isn't he up there doing this what did he do wrong but then again, that kind of goes back to there's there's just no way around being misinterpreted or misunderstood by people, no matter what I do. Because if I did do it, I could still have people upset thinking, why is he doing this? He's, you know, he's just lying or he's uh, he's not being ethical or, you know, there's no way around it. And I thought what's best for me and my circumstances was to just say, OK, well, I won't be involved with this process. Um, but that's got to be a little bit tragic, right? To uh, um, watch someone else baptize and confirm your own son, right? And to have everyone in the ward and extended family wonder, is he worthy? Is there a worthiness problem? What's the problem? I, I know I struggle with that with my own baptism of my son. And I think looking back, I kind of justified it and just said, I'll... I'm going to baptize him. And, and of course, Winston had to wait a year, but um, at the time I felt like I just couldn't bear someone else doing that. It was either going to be me or no one. Have you had to deal with those feelings at all? Um, yeah, I, I've, I've felt those feelings and uh, I was able to just kind of be with it for a minute and realize what, why does this really feel, where does, you know, where does the negative aspect of this feeling really come from? And I had to just be really honest with myself and understand it's, it comes from my ego, not wanting to, you know, I want to be looked at and, and think, oh, he's good. And I, and I want to avoid being looked at and think, oh, something's wrong. And, and that was kind of the driving force behind this entire thing feeling uncomfortable for me. But I had to, I had to kind of think, well, th this isn't about me at all. This is about, 
in, in a lot of ways, it's not even about my son. This is about our the family feeling comfortable and happy with the ritual that they're all used to and expecting is a something that's supposed to happen in life. And I thought, you know, doesn't my son when he's old enough and he he can be who he is, he'll he's the one who'll get to decide if this is all good for him and if it is good and if it's not, it's not. But meanwhile, I I was making this about me like uh, this this isn't about me. It's about everyone else feeling comfortable that one more in the family has joined the ranks and done what was expected of him, you know? Um, and, yeah, it, it, it doesn't mean it was easy. It's taken me years of thinking <laughs> every scenario and how I'm going to handle this, and, and now here I am. It's happening next month, and, and it's still not easy. A part of me wishes it could just be me so that because it's I, I still feel connected to it. It's my son. This is, you know... This is a, a cultural practice that up until now I felt connected to. And now I'm kind of feeling for the first time that idea of if you're not really completely one of us, then you're not one of us. You can't participate with us. And that that part is a little tragic and difficult, especially coming from, you know, ironically on the on, on the other side of my cultural background, like on the Catholic side, you never I have never felt that. It's always felt like, oh, that's OK. If you don't believe it completely the way you do, still come, still do it. You know, and from this side, it feels a, a little bit more like, well, if you don't exactly do it like us, maybe you're not quite welcome here. I mean, you're welcome here, but you're welcome here with the underlying intent of eventually becoming, viewing it like we do. As long as that's a possibility, it's all great. But if there's the possibility that you're that you don't view it like us. Maybe that's a little scary. Maybe you're a little poisonous, and, and that always feels bad to kind of be shunned a little bit you know yeah for me i always thought of it as a second class citizen and that you have to be quiet uh and silent a silent participant um so there's a couple there's a couple of good comments here uh we're about to wrap up this segment of the interview but i just want to get a few um of the listener comments and questions in um so i'll start with uh I'll start with Susan. She asks, is Giselle still active? Nick responded, but go ahead and respond. Yeah. Yeah, she is. And, um, yeah, she really enjoys the, uh, the whole experience of being a Mormon, of being a believer. Um, you know, she, I think she's, she has a very open way and healthy way of interpreting her, um, her faith and her, her testimony or her beliefs. Uh, I don't think she comes across, uh, and I, I guess I should say this for most people in, that I know in, in, in my Mormon circles and including my family, my extended, my, my wife's family, I think for them, it's, it, it's not about being wrong or right. It's, it's about this feels right. It feels like what I want in my life. And I think a lot of them, you know, including my wife, if, if they were ever confronted with the idea of, well, what if it's not true? I think that would be almost irrelevant. It'd be like, but it's good. It's what I like. It's what I want. And almost Pascal's wager type approach where it's like, I have nothing to lose if it's wrong. But um, but I'm at the same time, I'm not hinging everything on, but if I am right, then it pays off. It's more like, if I'm right, well, I'm right. And if I'm wrong, that's okay too. But it's what I enjoy. It's what makes sense to me. It's, uh, you know, the cultural ties, the, and it, a lot of the same things that, uh, that make my mom feel so comfortable with Catholicism. My mom doesn't treat Catholicism like, well, it's because this is the right one. It's more like, it's right for me. Um, a, a lot of people, a lot of people have this sort of reaction. If I raise my kids in the church, if I allow my kids to go to church, they're going to be poisoned. They'll become sexist and and bigoted and racist and homophobic and they'll get all these unhealthy messages about sexuality and it'll screw up their brain and and especially if they're gay then they're being raised in a toxic environment uh how do you get around the the petrifying fear that your children are going to be poisoned or brainwashed or damaged by remaining exposed to teachings of the church yeah, I think that's a good question and a valid point. Um, I think in, in our case, I don't have any of those fears with my kids because I think 
they will they're not going to be getting that from home they may be getting that from you know from from church or from beliefs in general but i think in in our home what they'll always experience is is more of an unconditional love like who you are is who you are that's never going to there's not a a right way or a wrong way to be you and i think you can get some of this in the church in in our case in our family i i don't think that's an issue for us now where i think that could be problematic is you know if if my wife was very um uh narrow minded with a lot of the the way things are are understood in the church I, that could certainly be problematic um in our case i don't think she is and i don't think that those are issues that would be problematic for us in the future i think there's a lot of love and acceptance that are in our home and i think in a lot of lds families that happens you know they might think that they're really far one way and then a son comes out or a daughter comes out as being gay and right away they're like okay boom and then everyone's like we need to make sure you know that you're loved and accepted and maybe you didn't know that till you're confronted with it um so i feel like the way we're tackling uh life as it unfolds is that we're tackling it as it unfolds rather than setting from here you know this is how the future is going to have to turn out and when this happens they have to do this and when that you know we're just kind of playing it by ear as it goes right one of the most toxic things that i experience is when you know non-believing spouse is trying to convince the kids to become atheist and to not go to church and believing spouse is trying to maintain a pristine view of joseph smith and of a historical book of mormon and the children become footballs in a religious battle between mm -hmm. the parents. And it sounds like one of the things that makes this possible for you is that Giselle is allowing you to share your candid, thoughtful views with the children. It maybe, maybe there isn't a sense of her being threatened or competitive about, or worried about you poisoning the kids. And on the flip side, you've obviously shown that you have confidence and comfort with her sharing her beliefs with the kids. And you're sort of putting the power in the child and saying, we both have respect for each other. We both view things differently. We're both going to share with you our different beliefs. And um, we're going to put the trust in you as a kid to figure out what feels right to you. And that way there isn't this fear or competition between believing and unbelieving spouse. Is that fair restatement? I think so. And I mean, I hate to, uh, that's certainly how I view it. I, 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 it feels like that's a lot of how she views it too. And I think, um, I think she understands that at some point there are, uh, certain things that to her feel like, no, this does have to be this way, or this does have to be that way. And those are things that we'll kind of tackle as we get there. For the most part, I think that's pretty accurate with, we kind of view it like, um, you know, when you get to decide, we, we've had topics like this that have come up. One, one day our son was asking us about, um, di he's way into dinosaurs. So we're talking about dinosaurs. And then he, he's kind of like, well, oh, no, this was with Adam and Eve. And he's like, did Adam have a belly button? Because we had been telling him the purpose of the belly button, you know, and the umbilical cord. So he was like, did Adam have a belly button? And so my wife started kind of explaining, well, I think, and she kind of gave her explanation and it was awesome because then she turned and she's like, Daddy, what do you think? And then I kind of gave, you know, from my view, from an evolutionary standpoint, you know, and I explained how I view things. And then when I was done, then we kind of turned like, well, what do you think? And he just kind of gave his answer. And then uh, we took that as an opportunity to tell him, you know, as you get older, you will have, you know, mom, mommy will say, this is how I view this. Daddy will say, well, this is how I view this. But it's important for you to know that you get to decide how do you view, you view things. And it's okay if it's different than how uh, mom views it, different than how dad views it, because you get to have your own. And I think uh, that's kind of a scary thought sometimes from the believing side. Um, but it's a healthy one, because at the end of the day, I think we, we both recognize that that's exactly what it is. It's, you know, we're, we're not going to impose our views in an authoritarian way, you know, yeah. like this is how it has to be. And I think that's to your credit, but I think it's even more to Giselle's credit because it's really rare for someone who's an Orthodox believer 
to allow for that level of trust um, in a child when they view like there's so much at stake in terms of orthodox belief. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, I'll just say, I'll just say, uh, Josh writes, I respect Noah for forging a way that feels truthful to him. Um, uh, Mark talks about, uh, going to his son's baptism, but not participating. He said he felt incredibly alone because you know, the Mormons in the room jump to the conclusion that you're not worthy. He says he wishes there was a more open mindset that people could choose to participate or not outside of worthiness. He says that's sad. Yeah, for um, sure. Uh, Steve Holbrook writes, it's not that tragic to watch others do the ordinance for your kids. At least it wasn't for me. I felt cleaner and plenty brave to just face it as a reality. But I only did this a few times before we stopped all such ordinances just to keep with tradition. So Steve says it wasn't that bad. Um, uh, Melissa writes, the disrespect is sad. The parents should be able to participate no matter what. Um, I think that that is a, is a legitimate point of view as well. Um, Josh writes, everything has its costs. Uh, were Noah to have gone the route of the faithful Mormon elder in the public eye, then he would have had to be inauthentic to himself. Um, it would have ate away at him. So this is, uh, oh, and I have to say Nick's comment. Nick says, we all live in unique social scenarios with costs, benefits, equations that are different. If I lived in Noah's circumstance, my relationship with the church may be more like his right now. My social circumstances are different. Therefore, I left the church without the cost it would probably give to him. I am happy with the coherence living gives to my story. And I respect the coherence staying has been to him. What do you think about that? Yeah, I agree completely. Yeah. Um, all right. So um, with that, I think we're coming to a close of this first episode of the interview uh before people tune out i just want to let them know both to the recording and to the live audience what we're going to do next is we're going to dig into a good hour of what secular buddhism is so we're going to give an introduction to secular buddhism and i just want to make a plug for secular buddhism it's not just like uh, for me it's not just an interesting point of view it's it's for me number one a valid and empirically supported framework for mental health in the 21st century. If you have anxiety, if you have depression, if you're not happy in your life, if you're struggling, uh, secular Buddhism can be a, and I'm saying this as someone with a PhD in clinical and counseling psychology, these principles will help you live a happier and a healthier and a better life. Not only if you're no longer religious, if you're an active, believing, orthodox, devout Mormon, these principles of secular Buddhism will help you uh, live your religion and be happier and healthier in your religion. And I would argue that the principles of secular Buddhism are consistent with Christianity and with Mormonism in a very deep and a profound way. Um, uh, so uh, finally, for transitioning and post-Mormons who feel like they've lost a sense of spirituality, maybe even don't like the term spirituality uh, and feel like they can't be spiritual anymore. My view is secular Buddhism provides a form of secular spirituality that in every way is either as nourishing or more nourishing than what I experienced in the church. Um, so for me, it has something for everyone. Do you uh, want to dispute that, Noah? <laughs> no, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. And then, so we'll dive into secular Buddhism as the next episode. And then what we're going to do is we're going to come back to sort of the Mormon Transitions interview, where we're just going to go question by question, more practically, what do you believe about God now? What do you believe about Jesus now? What do you believe about um, raising kids? What's your approach to spirituality? What's your approach to you know, life to meaning to purpose. And it's going to be very much sort of for people either trying to make progressive Mormon work or post Mormon work, Mormonism work. 
It'll be tips and tricks and approaches that you've found to specifically navigating a Mormon transition. How does that sound? Great. Okay. So I'm going to sign off to this Mormon Stories episode one. Uh, thank all the Mormon Stories listeners for checking us out. Please email us at mormonstories at gmail.com. Please come up to the blog at mormonstories.org and make comments. Uh, thank you for everyone who financially supports us. Your financial support is what makes this possible. Um, so please continue, if you can, to become a monthly subscriber. And so with that, don't hang up, Noah. Don't hang up, uh, Facebook Live listeners and watchers. I'll sign off, and then we'll continue just right back on with the next segment of the interview. Does that sound all right? Yep. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care.